The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. Showtime! Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome, one and all, to Night Fright. Tonight, folks, the Martin Luther King assassination. The night before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King made one final speech. Please listen to these words with me. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. And so just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Something else, eh, folks? Martin Luther King had this capacity to reach people deep in their hearts, deep in their souls. He was something else. Um, The very next day, right after that speech, April 4th, 1968, he was assassinated by what people say was a lone, single gunman. Maybe not. Maybe there was a conspiracy there. After all, in a new book called The Awful Grace of God with researcher Larry Hancock, who fans of this show will know has been here many times before, he brings, along with Stuart Wexler, his co-author, bold new evidence of a conspiracy but perhaps not in the direction you were thinking. Stick with us tonight, folks, because this is going to be really explosive. We're going to look at Dr. King and all the things that were surrounding him at the time and who wanted him dead. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. And now you host Brent 
JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Welcome, welcome, one and all. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to Night Fright. Folks, a new book tonight called The Awful Grace of God about the Kennedy, the Kennedy assassin, about Martin Luther King's assassination, April 4th, 1968, with researcher Larry Hancock. Folks of, uh, that have been watching the show and are fans of the show will recognize that name. He's been on the show many times before, primarily talking about the Kennedy assassination. Tonight, we're going to be looking at his new book with Stuart Lexler, called The Awful Grace of God, about the Martin Luther King assassination. I want to welcome you back, all the way from Oklahoma, folks. How you doing, Larry? It's great to be back, Brett. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Wonderful to see you again, and let's hope Skype holds up, because it's a little bit stormy out there, and as we all know with Skype, folks, it's finicky. It's really finicky. Okay, let's jump in right away. Dr. Martin Luther King, can you tell the folks that may not be aware of the things surrounding April 4, 1968, what happened that day, and what is the official story about James Earl Ray, of course, um, surrounding the assassination? The official story is really a very simple one, as it is in most lone nut scenarios, and that is that James Earl Ray was sitting, well, not sitting, but standing in a small bathroom of a very inexpensive rooming house across the street from the motel in which Dr. King was staying and had been there for a couple of days. He was there for a revisit to a sanitation workers' march that had – he had been in the first march, which had – gone bad and turned into riots and demonstrations. He had sworn that he would come back to lead a peaceful march. They had had to reschedule because of weather, but he was finally back, and he had been in the city meeting with a number of people trying to ensure the march was, that was going to be peaceful. And this was in Memphis, the heart of the South. This was in Memphis, the heart of the South, and in, in what had become a very volatile situation. I think, again, people may not realize that Martin Luther King had not just shown up there, that this wasn't just a routine visit or a routine, yes, he had addressed church meetings there, and he had been in Memphis many times, but the situation in, in Memphis had really gone downhill in the preceding two or three months uh, in a, a conflict between city management and sanitation workers, who were mostly black, and uh, the the local police had been freely using black intelligence officers to gather information on the demonstrators and on their plan marches. And it, it had gone on for so long that those intelligence officers were well known to the demonstrators. And actually, uh, when they would go to meetings on a couple of occasions, they had to be rescued by the organizers of the marches because everyone had to realize that they were it, it was a tense situation and so tense that both sides had literally start stopped talking with each other what was the threat to local authorities we'll start off there and then we'll look at the uh, national authorities of dr king being in memphis that day and to lead that particular march well i think that the threat as they perceived it is that they had had an ongoing the situation in Memphis had been tense for a couple of years. There had been some riots. There had been pretty extensive breakage and rioting on some of the main streets during prior demonstrations, and they were literally quite concerned that there would be a repeat of a massive demonstration. And not only would there be a repeat of the massive demonstration, but they didn't have a solution. There was no talking going on. There was no negotiation going on. And they really felt that, as with many cities in 1968, as you'll remember, Brent, that it could turn into a major urban conflict. And so they were very, very concerned about large-scale violence. On the other hand... Larry, Martin just Luther as an King analogy, um, sorry to interrupt you, just as an analogy for the younger folks that are, are watching right now, could we draw comparisons in the terms of uh, the violent, the potential for violence in the streets with the, um, I was going to say the idle no more, um, 
uh, what was the name of the movement that was a couple of years ago? Larry, help me out. I'm going to edit this part out. Oh, the what? anti-globalist? Uh, the yeah. uh, Some of those demonstrations? Yeah. Would there be uh, a comparison for the uh, threat of violence? Very, very minor. Uh, the even though there was widespread violence in those in, in some cities, I think in, in uh, the occupy in Canada movement. and the the occupation movement is what you're thinking about. Yes, the occupation groups. Again, the occupation groups were essentially nonviolent. There were confrontations. There were breakages. There's littering. There's but not in terms of the actual armed conflict where you had people shooting each shooting each other and protest involving thousands of people with burning and looting not really the occupy movement would pale in comparison I, I have a couple of friends who were in a couple of the occupy movement events and it was it's not if people look at that and think of this uh, this would be magnified by a factor of 10 or more so you're looking at sheer riots and um, all kinds of damage to the All kinds infrastructure of, of any city. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Daily Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Folks, we're talking about a new book today that's looking at bold new research by Larry Hancock. And uh, folks that watch his show on a regular basis will recognize that name and, of course, Larry himself. Last time he was here, he talked about Nexus, which is the CIA's involvement in assassination. And his classic book on the Kennedy assassination is called Someone Would Have Talked. And um, you can get all three of these books, easy way as always, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a place where you can order the book, as always, from the comfort of your own home. Larry, there was a single shooter. There was one bullet that hit Dr. King from across the way where he was, he was standing outside on a gallery at uh, the Lorraine Motel. The shot came in, hit him in the cheek, went right through his neck, and he was dead within minutes. One single shooter, the purported shooter, was James Earl Ray. Now, I want to jump right away because there's a huge Canadian connection, and I want to look at this intensively tonight in James Earl Ray, not only before the assassination, but after as well as part of his escape route. Can we talk a little bit about that, James Earl Ray, and his Canadian connection? Oh, certainly, and and it's just one final thing before we leave the context of Memphis, if we could. Please. We talked about what they were concerned about. Martin Luther King's primary focus at that point in time was the planned march that was scheduled for Washington, D.C., and which had to be a nonviolent march. So just as much as the authorities in Memphis were concerned about violence, King was concerned that if he could not do an unviolent march in Memphis – how could he go on to Washington? So that the there's poor a real people's march. the poor people's march. So he was there, totally focused on a peaceful environment. But the Canadian connection for Ray is very interesting because what a lot of people don't realize about James Earl Ray is his behavior was very repetitive. He had been in Kansas, in, in Canada, all of the places that he went after the assassination were places that he had been before: Canada, Mexico. Los Angeles. He had been in Canada early on. Ray was a career criminal, not a, a professional type criminal, but a career burglar, robber, armed robbery. And uh, he was used to performing crimes and going on the road, traveling a lot, or escaping from prison and traveling a lot. He got to do that pretty well, too. So he had been in Canada before. And actually, he was in Canada. Uh, almost a year before the assassination after a prison escape from Jefferson City Penitentiary. And he had made his way and met with some of his relatives in the Chicago area and then gone across the border into Canada and spent a considerable amount of time. His goal at that point in time was literally to get off the continent. He was – the next time he's arrested, this is going to be it. You know, he's escaped from prison. It, it would be done. So he really wanted to get away badly, and he spent a considerable amount of time. He, he had a misunderstanding, and 
he thought that he had to go through a particular process to get authorization to transit Canada. And so he, he spent some time trying to hook up with a Canadian woman who would actually vouch for him and allow him to get the proper paperwork to get transit through Canada. Uh, that didn't work out. He did meet a woman, but then when he became friends with her, he found out that she worked for the Canadian government, and that scared him off, and he came back to the United States. But so he he spent time considerable time in Canada before the assassination. Yeah, folks, he ended up Expo sixty seven year, uh, nineteen sixty seven, uh, in Montreal, and you're looking at a map right now. You'll see on it several indicate, indicating markers there. You're going to see one where none other than Lee Harvey Oswald was spotted. Uh, prior to the JFK assassination, and we all know Lee Harvey Oswald was the purported assassin for JFK, right around the corner you're going to notice that is exactly where uh, James Earl Ray was spotted meeting this character, this shady character we're going to get into called Raoul. And that's all this takes place down in what's called Old Montreal, um, which is down at the bottom of the hill. Uh, Montreal is an old volcano, folks. It is not active, although there's a lot of explosive stuff going on there these days with the language laws. I'm making jest as an ex-Montrealer. But um, fascinating stuff. And as you notice, just up the hill at the Allen Memorial, uh, where McGill University is, you're looking at the map still, that's where uh, mind control experiments took place in the 60s and the 50s as well, called MK Ultra, and they were CIA experiments. So a lot of stuff going on. Let's not forget two important factors. Montreal was and still is the center of all organized crime activity in Canada. And the other factor is, folks, where uh, in old Montreal, St. James Street, St. Jacques now, because they had to change the name. Don't get me started on Office de l'Enfant Français language laws. Crazy. Anyways, um, that was the center of, that was Bay Street. That was Wall Street, if you will, in Canada in those days. A lot of power, a lot of money there, a lot of stuff happening. And uh, as I've just read in Larry's book also, Larry mentions a street called Notre Dame, Rue de Notre Dame. That is virtually one block from where Lee Harvey Oswald was spotted, two blocks from where James Earl Ray was spotted. So there we have it. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of smoke, perhaps some fire. Let's go back to Larry, his new book, The Awful Grace of God, Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy, and the Unsolved Murder of Martin Luther King Jr. Larry, do you think James Earl Ray acted alone? No. No, James Earl Ray was definitely part of a conspiracy. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Without giving too much of the book away, can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to that revelation? I guess the the fundamental thing that convinced me of that, regardless of all of the ballistics evidence, the forensics evidence, is, is a study of James Earl Ray himself. If you really spend enough time looking at Ray and Ray's backgrounds and his his criminal career and his travels, and even looking at the statements from his family members, James Earl Ray was totally apolitical. He his only interest was in living the life expect, making a living by not working, by committing robberies. Uh, that's just what he had turned into a career. And there's nothing about him, although it's pretty clear from various documents and evidence of his time in prison that he, he didn't like blacks. As a matter of fact, he refused to be transferred to better quarters because it was a mixed race. He didn't like them, but that was nothing particularly different than anyone from his generation and his origins. There's where just he, no where did motive. he grow up, Larry? Was he uh, from the south, from the north? Uh, he was from the southern Midwest, I guess you'd say, and the, the okay. border between the – actually a little river town near the border between Illinois and Missouri. Uh, okay. A very, very poor town, a uh, very poor family. Uh, he did get factory work for a time. He went into the Army for a time, Got didn't do well in the Army. He was definitely not the kind of person who followed rules. Was well, he a low-life drifter? Uh, Would you classify him as that? 
I would classify him as a low life drifter, but with a caveat. He was very cunning, very not not an unintelligent person. He learned his craft well, he learned his trade well, he spent lots of time in prison and was a quick study. Uh, so not an untutored uh, low life drifter, but a, a, a very, very bright individual at what he did. Uh, so I don't want to make him look like someone who uh, doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, not a not a redneck off a farm or something like that with no clue whatsoever. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts for yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Now the book is called, folks, The Awful Grace of God, Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy and the unsolved murder of Martin Luther King by two authors, Stuart Wexler and Larry Hancock, who's with us tonight. Easy way to get the book, as always, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a place where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. Part of the title, Larry, is Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy. Can we go in that direction now? Because this was a revelation for me. All these years with all the conspiracies and all the assassinations, I had always presumed, like many listeners I think right now, that it was the government somehow was behind that. Not so, according to your research. Can we talk a little bit about how all that comes together? Uh, you bet. And and I think the transition from that, and, and just to close up on Ray, is... If we keep in mind that Ray was interested in Ray, not politics, not race, but in making money. Mm. And particularly by 1968, Ray was desperate to get out and escape the United States uh, and get off the continent. So his motives have to do with money, uh, not with Martin Luther King from any political or racist aspect. So then the transition is if his motives don't have anything to do with that. Uh, whose motives do if James Earl Ray it is very interesting and, and one similarity to the JFK case as you know Brent nobody was ever co able to come up with a reasonable motive for Lee Harvey Oswald that's right absolutely no one has ever come up with a reasonable personal personal motive for James Earl Ray to kill Martin Luther King those dots just don't connect that's right. uh, the prosecution didn't attempt it of course the prosecution got an easy out because Ray took a guilty plea in, a plea in court, but that's another story. But to, to continue with your question, where Stu and I started is basically after looking at Ray, doing our standard literature searches, reading everything that had been written, looking at the documents on Ray, looking at all the FBI documents, uh, we came to the conclusion that something had to be behind Ray. So just just as you were talking, the question is, who is behind Ray? And what we started finding was a host of actual leads. These would be FBI documents, FBI inv investigations, that once you cut two or three levels beyond where the FBI had stopped, you found a group of people that had been trying to kill Dr. King for some years. Wow. And you found these same people connected to the process of actually – recruiting people, offering bounties, making money, money offers on the life of Dr. King. One of the first things that we came up with was the fact that this, this group of people who were on the surface you might think of as racist, the, the White Knights, the Ku Klux Klan of Mississippi, but at a lower level than that had their leader's own agenda, which was very much different. And uh, it gets to be complex, as you saw in the book, but it's it's interesting when you read the leader of the group telling one of the group that these people are all cannon fodder. They have no clue as to what's going on, and he has his own agenda, at which was a actually a religious agenda, uh, an end of the world uh, scenario, Armageddon-type scenario, bringing about the, the end of the world uh, long story there, but – so we started tracing these leads to see if we could find a connection because one of the things that you typically do if you're looking for an assassination conspiracy is it would be 
interesting to find people who had tried to do this before and failed, but were Look provably for a template, something that, that you, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. provably trying to do it and have yeah. a track record and have a history. And we we tracked down and verified that this group had actually paid money or were willing to pay money in 1964 to kill Dr. King. And they extended a bounty offer, brought a person down south, a contract killer, actually a contract killer from Oklahoma, and uh, had set up to assassinate Dr. King. Their problem was at the last minute, they couldn't come up with enough cash to close the deal and the attack didn't happen. We traced that further and we found that that one of this, this fellow, his name was Sparks Associates, in 1967 and 1968 was involved in extending this same offer within a couple of federal prison systems. And the offer was stated very specifically as coming from the White Knights, the Ku Klux Klan. Same people, same offer, more money. And Can I just interrupt oh, you sure. there? Um, most people are aware somewhat of what the KKK is, uh, a bunch of white racists, uh, anti-everything except uh, wasps, if you will, their, their own kind. Um, can you give a brief overview of how powerful they were, how feared they were in those days, some of the atrocities they committed? They they. In general, the Klan operated at two levels. There was the broad-based Klan that was into intimidation, beatings, threats, threats, beating up people during the set-ins, the, the bus rides, the freedom rides, basically a broad-based campaign of intimidation, if you will. Uh, no, no blacks buying houses in white areas, no blacks eating with whites, just – Integration. The, the Klan was defending integration, and brutally. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But there was a level within the Klan, referred to as inner circles, who were much more violent than that and who routinely murdered, uh, tortured, and killed individuals that they felt were moving the movement forward. Uh, I want to show, but, Larry, um, and I think a good way to do this – the extent of the violence that they were capable of, the KKK, and perhaps the best way to do that is to refer to a movie called Mississippi Burning. Could we? Could you walk us through that? Because folks today, uh, for better or for worse, get a lot of their history from movies. Um, that's just the way it is. There's a really good movie out there, folks, called Mississippi Burning that is based on this historical fact that Larry's going to tell us right now. Thanks, Larry. Sure, and, and I think it's very important. Mississippi burning isn't just about the Klan in general. Mississippi burning is about the white knights of the Ku Klux Klan, That's the right. people that I am talking about. And Mississippi burning is about the fact that these people had very organized, very structured inner circles to conduct these murders. And these were murders of intimidation. And one of the primary crimes that they committed to ultimately led to their downfall was to target and kill three civil rights workers uh, that were working in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And it was a very organized plan. And Mississippi burning is all about not only the crime, but how the FBI investigated it and eventually cracked it and tracked down and convicted people that were involved. And it's it's an excellent movie because it shows the sophistication, actually, of these people. Again, they certainly were not rednecks. They had, they had some very sophisticated tactics. They're, the head of the organization named Sam Bowers was a very deep thinker, a strategist, a very religious person uh, with his own strange religion of Christian identity. Um, but – he organized something, a tactic called setting on go. And setting on go is a very interesting tactic because they knew it by that point in time that the FBI was watching them. So they really couldn't – they could plan a, a crime in concept, but they would lay out the crime, and then the people that laid out the plan would not be involved in it at all. They would make a telephone call. It would be passed through two or three cutouts, and individuals – would respond with no advance notice 
they would get the, the simplest of instructions. In Mississippi burning, the three men happened to have car trouble, got picked up by a sheriff, put in jail. A phone call was made by the deputy sheriff to his white knight contact. Sitting on go was activated, and the three men were shouted as they left the police station, eventually pulled off the road, killed, and buried in a dam. And it was not a coincidence. The dam that they were buried in had been picked as the place for that crime months in advance as part of the sitting on go operation. And the sitting on go operation was we're going to teach these people a lesson that are coming into Mississippi. We're going to scare them to death and they will leave. That was the concept. But as I say, it's tactically very sophisticated and the FBI had a terrible time dealing with the crime, eventually only solved it by offering very large informant bounties to a number of these people, putting enough pressure on them so that they cracked them and getting informants. And the interesting thing from our perspective is some of the same informants that they got in Mississippi burning are informants that show up in the case. Wow. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brendan Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Folks, an explosive book tonight. We're talking about the. Uh, uh, I almost said it again, the JFK Assassination, but. Uh, the reason why that comes to mind is because I'm going to bring up a connection there. Uh, the Awful Grace of God, Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy, and the Unsolved Murder of Martin Luther King Jr. by our guest tonight, Larry Hancock, and co-author Stuart Wexler. www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover and order the book. Do yourself a favor. Um, Lots of time left, folks. If you're just joining us, settle in. We're talking about the King assassination tonight with none better than Larry Hancock. Uh, some bold new research. Uh, just explosive stuff. We've just covered a whole Canadian connection with James Earl Ray, the purported assassin of Dr. King. And now we're looking at the KKK's involvement and white supremacy in the uh, murder. And we're describing some of the atrocities that they had committed. Now... Larry, as you just told us that wonderful story about Mississippi burning, what came to mind is exactly what's in the title of your book, which is Religious Terrorism. You know, if we just transplaced or transported uh, the KKK uh, a thousand miles over to Afghanistan and called them the Taliban, there would be virtually no difference. Um, and this is something that, I d that your book brings up very, very well. The fact that these ideas weren't even entertained in the 60s by law enforcement, that it could be religious terrorism. Can we talk a little bit about that and what led to the rumors and uh, to this day the rumors are still abound that it was the government behind it and how that just isn't possible? I think two things. As you say, law enforcement, they knew about the first tier of the Klan. They knew that the Klan was violent, but they were working at a, a fairly high level, I guess you would say. They, they didn't understand the, the network, and that's a big part of the, the book, actually, is the social network that was behind all, behind all this. They had no idea that these different inner circles and the ultra-right groups were linked and actually coordinating their activities, communicating on a regular basis that Sam Bowers in Mississippi would send one of his chief terror lieutenants, who at the time was bombing Jewish synagogues, to Los Angeles to coordinate activities with the leader of the Christian identity movement and the current acting leader of the Minutemen. Uh, they just, which is strange because we found an informant report from Los Angeles talking about the visit. The vi informant report was from a Minuteman who was talking about this guy that was in town from Mississippi who was working with these people on coordinating plans, but he was a Minuteman informant to the FBI. So Can guess you tell where the his... folks who the Minutemen were? 
Uh, the Minutemen were, were an ultra-right organization who were primarily anti-communist. Their, their fixation was communist infiltration in the government. Uh, they, they certainly did, they did cross the border because they felt Martin Luther King was a communist tool. But their hatred for him and opposition to him was more that they felt that blacks were communist tools rather than a strictly racial thing. So it was, I guess you would think fellow traveler might be the best term to use. And the Minutemen and the Klan, and, and in particular the White Knights, had things in common, but they had different focus, I guess would be the best way to look at it. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brendan Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Folks, if you're just joining us, lots of time left. As I said before, we're looking at the Dr. King assassination tonight with a new book out called The Awful Grace of God, Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy, and the unsolved murder of Martin Luther King Jr. And our guest tonight is Larry Hancock. He's co-author with Stuart Wexler. Easy way to get the book, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. As always, we'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own armchair. Now, Larry, we would just been talking about the KKK, white supremacists, and I was wondering when I read the book, is there a possibility that when James Earl Ray, the purported assassin of Dr. King, fled to Canada, that he met up with some of these white supremacists here in Canada? Is that a possibility that it was that organized, that it transcended borders? We think that there's a a very reasonable chance of that because this network uh, involved, we know, actually the documents confirm it, that there were... Canadian racist who traveled down to Birmingham, and they were very active in the same. Well, they're very active with some of the groups uh, that are 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 part of our suspect list. And it's our our scenario is that Ray was looking for offers. He had heard about the bounty offer on King in prison. That's documented. How much money was that, by the way, Larry? Was it a well, it was a two. It's very important because it was a twofold offer. The offer for shooting King was a hundred thousand dollars, but for twenty thousand dollars, if you wanted to sign up to be a leg man, just to do surveillance on King, maybe carry a weapon, basically play a support role, it was twenty thousand dollars. Now that's uh, and it's our suspicion that that Ray signed up for the support role, not the shooting role. And this is nineteen sixty dollars we're talking about, so. What would that be about tenfold now? Yes, yes, it would. Wow. And and even the twenty thousand dollars at that point in time, if Ray had gotten twenty thousand dollars or even part of that money, he he would have been able to do anything that he wanted to do in terms of getting off the continent, uh, which was his goal. So yes, it was a it was a very substantial offer, and one of the reasons it was so substantial is because they were having a great deal of difficulty recruiting people. This bounty had been pitched to a number of people, and the professionals just weren't buying into it. Why and they was were having that? to pitch it to other people. Now, you would think a guy like Martin Luther King would be the antichrist, if you will, for white supremacists. I thought they would have been coming out of the woodworks uh, and willing to kill him for free, given the the racial motivation behind the KKK's dastardly deeds they'd done in the past. Not so. Well, I think there's a mix there. In, in, in the group that we're talking about, the White Knights had actually tried to do it themselves on multiple occasions. And the only reason they failed was that King kept changing his travel plans at the last minute. And several of their attempts just aborted because he wasn't where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be. Uh, they almost killed him uh, on a couple of occasions with bombs. Almost killed him on one occasion, shooting into the place he was staying, but he had left. And so it, it is not that they had not tried themselves, but by 1968, you talked, or we talked about Mississippi burning. The FBI was all over these guys. Uh, a great number of the White Knights had been convicted of the Mississippi burning uh, killings, as had Sam Bowers. And 
They knew that there were informants throughout the organization. And at that point in time, they actually started turning to people outside their organization because they knew they were so compromised. So it's not that they would not have wanted to. They were just put in under intense pressure by 1968 in terms of doing it themselves. This is something, Larry, that has always puzzled me. You mentioned the successful incarceration and um, uh, cases brought by the FBI. Yet we know the distance between Dr. King and the head of the FBI at that time, Hoover, was unapproachable. I mean, it was unbridgeable. Um, can we explain a little bit of that dichotomy? I always, I, it just puzzles the heck out of me. Um, once, we, we, can, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. we can explain the dichotomy because uh, for Hoover, it was a very personal thing. Mm. Uh, Dr. King had criticized Hoover's organization for not involving themselves in preventing attacks during demonstrations uh, and, and had criticized the FBI. And if you criticize the FBI and the media, Hoover was not going to be your buddy. Uh, and it really – it devolved into a very personal thing between the two men. However, in terms of the Mississippi burning killings and the overall terrorism in the South, the person who pushed Hoover's button was the president. And we document several instances in the book where Lyndon Johnson – literally called up Hoover and told them he would provide special security because there was a known threat from the White Knights or ordered the Mississippi burning pressure. Uh, Hoover was not doing it voluntarily. He was doing it because he was receiving direct orders and Johnson was doing it due to political pressure. Mm -hmm. And that Mississippi burning incident we keep referring to folks took place in 1964. JFK had been assassinated in 1963, and Vice President Linda Johnson had taken over. Um, there was also a dichotomy between, uh, we'll stay on the subject of dichotomies, between Bobby Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, and also J. Edgar Hoover and civil rights. I mean, there was so many civil rights demonstrations uh, that um, Bobby just had to keep phone calling and phone calling Hoover to do something. Can we talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, and, and Hoover Hoover would take orders. I mean, the bottom line is when he had he, – he wanted to keep his job. He wanted to uh, – he didn't necessarily like it, but he would also push back. And one of the things that we re relate in the book, and uh, Gerald McKnight has done a, a great job of this in his, his book on, uh, on Dr. King, is – the, the extent to which Hoover would consistently issue reports that were embarrassing and, and, and terrible reports on King as a threat, and Bobby Kennedy would have to come back and say, no, stop doing that. Stop circulating this to every government agency. Uh, no, you can't do it. And there was a really a constant – by 1968, basically the bottom line is everybody had pretty much – gotten fed up with Director Hoover's personal enmity toward King, and you start seeing correspondence and messages, and Hoover's just not getting it. He's, he's continuing to send them out, and nobody wants to hear it. There's a famous rumor, unsubstantiated rumor, that Dr. King had been fooling around on his wife on several occasions, and tapes were made by the FBI. They had mic'd his hotel rooms, etc., etc. These tapes were compiled and sent to his wife, Coretta. What is your opinion on these tapes to black oh, men? That, that, is, that is now substantiated. There's no doubt okay. about that. So that is, uh, that is documented. Um, it looks like in that particular case, of course, King did order the bugging. And during a certain period of time, not King, but who ordered understood. the bugging. <laughs> but... Um, one of the one of the things that complicated matters was that one of Dr. King's longtime advisors and financial consultants uh, had actually been a con member of the Communist Party. That was correct, and unfortunately, Stanley although that Levinson. had nothing to do with anything that was going on, Hoover managed to play that against RFK and. Mm -hmm and bring up the communist card and force on a couple of occasions to allow um, taping 
and bugging of, of Dr. King. And they did put together tapes that I, I think the best that we understand of the tapes is they're purported to be Dr. King. Whether or not they were is a big question. But one of Hoover's subordinates did indeed put that together, package together and mail it to Mrs. King uh, to put pressure on him to literally drop out of what he was doing. Dirty, dirty politics, wasn't it? Unbelievable. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. Folks, the book is called All These Revelations it, by It the, Was Dirty these, Politics. Yeah. Um, all these revelations, folks, are brought to you in this book. The book is called The Awful Grace of God, Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy and the unsolved murder of Martin Luther King Jr. Our guest tonight is Larry Hancock. He is co-author with Stuart Wexler. Um, you'll find Stuart's shows in the archives as well as Larry's. Larry, one of the most chilling things I read in your book, and this is impeccable research from you as always, Joseph Miltier. And why that sent chills, and I'm getting them now, right up and down my spine, folks, is because he is all over the John Kennedy assassination, and now he's all over the Martin Luther King assassination. Can we talk a little bit about that ominous little tidbit in there? We absolutely can, and I think one of the things that we can make a pretty conclusive case on about this point in time is this same circle of people that we're talking about, these this ultra-right uh, radical network was had an overall agenda. And that overall agenda essentially focused on the communist, the blacks as tools of the communist. It all wrapped together. And uh, Miltier was a part of this nation network. network. He traveled frequently. He had met with the same people in Los Angeles that I mentioned before. And now we know that this group of people was actually had been training rifle teams. And those rifle teams were being trained in 1963 to kill President Kennedy, several other political leaders, and a number of Jewish financiers and financial figures. And those rifle teams were very real. And Miltier and his group were definitely planning to go after John Kennedy. Someone else got there first. In, in my personal opinion, that's another yeah. story. Yeah. But that that hatred transferred on to other people. It transferred on to people like Dr. King, to Robert Kennedy. So if, if Miltier was in Dallas, and I think there's a chance that he was, I have – there's no – there's no conflict there because – we know his descriptions about their plans and the planning of shooting into a motorcade from a tall building. There's very good evidence that they were monitoring and surveilling the president's travels and motorcades as part of their planning for an attack. So they would just move that template from the Kennedy assassination right exactly. over to Dr. King five years exactly. later. Larry, you know, I get asked this question a lot of times because this show covers... I would say more than any other show of this genre, the Kennedy assassination, of course, the Bobby assassination, and Dr. King's as well. And we touch on Malcolm X as well. Why does it matter? I mean, these assassinations happened 50 years ago and counting. Why does it matter to the people today? I think it matters because for two big reasons. First of all, as we talked about earlier, these beliefs and practices are not unique in time. Religious terrorism, a factor in Dr. King's killing, is still a major factor in the world today. Uh, religious terrorism, inner circles with their own special agendas as threats, uh, nationwide and global terror networks, it's a common. It, it doesn't go away. It comes back in another form. And the second part of that, it's important to us because we have to understand that to deal with them, we have to understand them, and we have to be prepared for them. And one of the things that we saw 
uh, in 2001 was that we were not prepared to deal with these kind of terror networks, and we learned the hard way. But those terror networks aren't any different than the terror networks that we're talk talking about. And Precisely. as you saw in the book, we try to bring out that point that that a they are the same. If you understand them, you can at least try to deal with them. If you ignore them, you're going to get hurt sooner or later. You know, folks, uh, April 4th, 1968. And by the way, folks, you know the U2 song Pride is all about Dr. King as well. Early morn, um, well, how, does, how do lyrics go? Early morn, a Memphis sky, shot rings out in a Memphis sky. Free at last, free at last. Uh, they took his uh, life, but they could not take his pride. It's all about Dr. King. Um, April 4th, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. Only three months later in June, uh, two months later in June, Bobby would be gone. I always say that perhaps Bobby's assassination was the biggest of the three, including JFK's, because we ended up with Nixon. What happened? What was cut off with the death of Martin Luther King? The interesting thing is, and, and you, you might find this surprising, Brent, King's message went on, and I think obviously it did become successful. What, what was cut off was our belief in the fact that we could be told the truth about these things. Uh, we lost a, a great deal of confidence in the fact that our government could investigate these political assassins, assassinations, report on us to a convincing matter. And so in the end, we were left with three lone nuts and three things that are just plain intuitively wrong, and we lost faith in our government. And to me, that's – that's probably the largest thing that stopped. Martin Luther King's goal continued. Bobby Kennedy's goals continued. So did John Kennedy's goals continued. But keep talking. What okay. followed those assassinations hurt us in our general attitude towards the government and our own confidence in ourselves. Agreed. Folks, you're going to want to get this book. Our guest tonight has been Larry Hancock, all the way from Oklahoma. The book is called The Awful Grace of God, Religious Terrorism, White Supremacy, and the Unsolved Murder of Martin Luther King Jr. We're going to leave tonight, folks, with the words of Dr. King once more. This is his most famous speech, I Have a Dream. I'm Brent Holland. Thank you, Larry, for joining us. We'll see you next time. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. Yes. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. Yes. I have a dream mm -hmm. that one day yes. this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. But my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor 
having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right now in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brendan Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com.